and they're like, we put an update out, and you're like, oh, did that make things better? They're like, yes, <laughs> but actually, no. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I'm going to jail! <laughs> I love that fucking meme. Oh, I, I made, I, I have, um, I have my, one of my friends, he does like video editing and we have basically made the worst meme ever. Um, and it's not cause it's like cringe or anything. It's just cause it's like morally dubious it's in nature. Oh man. I fucking, there was this one video that people were like shitting on. Oh wait, hold on. Let me actually properly orient my camera. There was this one video that people were shitting on, uh, about this lady who charged this, like, who charged this black cop out, like. The, head, the headline was just leading. She was like, you saying a bunch of like racial slurs and shit, but she just like charged this black cop. And, um, he has to shoot her, unfortunately. And, um, uh, <laughs> I told, I sent him the video and I was like, yo, can you like dub Big Iron over this, like from Fall Hut? And like, <laughs> I love that song. <laughs> and, 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 um, and fucking like add in that effect, that, that, you know, that dead eye effect from fucking Red Dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to you guys. After. I can't play it on stream because it's too it's too bad. But I'll send it to you guys because it's so fucking funny. Uh, and whenever I see like a, a video, I'm just like, yo, I'll give you twenty dollars. Make this meme, and then I'll just give them the instructions. <laughs> oh man! But oh, let's play some D and D. All right. So where we left off. Um, Marlo, I had nearly spirited you away into the night. Uh, some wear goats had uh, stuffed you in a bag. And, uh, oops, that camera's not centered on where you guys are. Had stuffed you in a bag, successfully used some essence of ether to knock you out, and we're going to take you uh, somewhere. You don't know where. But uh, the guards were able to stop it, fortunately. You were able to uh, be able to survive your close encounter of the, of the third kind, we should say. All right. So, <clears throat> it is the new morning. Uh, you guys hear commotion downstairs. You are in the Crock and Miller. Hold on, let me see if I can get some. Uh... I mean, it's the new morning. There are people. There are like you know the morning people out there eating like you know breakfast, mainly consisting of like you know cheese and bread and like you know some meat and stuff like that, obviously. And. Uh, there is a bit of uh, commotion surrounding what had happened last night, but uh, largely people are just getting on with their day-to-day -day stuff, like coming out of their rooms, going to, the, to, to get laundered and whatnot. But uh, uh, I'll set us off right where we left off, which was, I think, uh, Doran was, like, sort of moaning because, uh, not, not, you know, moaning as in, like, oh, like moaning, like complaining. <laughs> he was complaining that... Uh, you guys would have to stay here longer because the northern exit, like, you know, the, the road that leads north out of Nornheim is closed because of the recent crisis. And uh, he is obviously so, sort of muffed by that, but uh, as soon as you guys do get up and sort of converse with each other, you, you all have been put up to speed on what exactly happened yesterday. I remember Marlo having said that he told you. The owner of the establishment, I don't think I wrote his name. In fact, I am... Hold on. Wow, in fact, hold on. I... There we go. Yeah, I wasn't sure if Connor was aware of what happened last night. He probably just greeted Marlo going like, Hey, sleep well? <laughs> sleep well. So he slept very well. In a that way. Was, that was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I... I unfortunately... Yeah, I didn't give him a name, unfortunately. But uh, the the owner is going to come up with you, and he's essentially going to be... He's going to come with the, the guy who is on guard duty in tow. And he's going to be, like, saying, like, Oh, um, I, I hope this won't affect your patronage in the Crock and Miller. You know, uh, we were willing to, you know, recompensate all the money that you had spent the previous day. This is a horrible travesty, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the guard is going to be complaining about how he wasn't even sure how it happened. He, for some reason, he just, like, mysteriously just, like, fell asleep and he woke up on the floor after the fact oh, well that's how they that's how they get you it's exactly what they did to me so uh, no hard no hard feelings the you know 
the 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 refund is is you know sufficient enough apology <laughs> the the average tavern is not equipped to deal with were goats infiltrations <laughs> but uh the uh the houndsman who is a uh... Th think of like you know a, a, the medieval era investigator, medieval renaissance. There, there, since there's not any like you know such thing as detectives, I guess during this time, is a uh, in any civilized city or just large settlement uh, is a man who has a hound that's you know specialized for sniffing out like you know evil doers or blood trails or etc. Uh, a man with a hound does approach you and he does ask you some questions. He introduces himself as a uh, Werner Altman. And, uh, he's just gonna ask you, like, you know, the basic affair, like, oh, and do you know where they took you, do you know how many were there, et cetera, just, like, some standard issue stuff. He explains that he works for the guard, and, uh, he's, uh, of course gonna ask, like, anybody you're affiliated with, Doran, and, you know, Doran and, uh, and, uh, Connor, obviously, since you guys were asleep during the affair, you wouldn't have much to say. Mm -hmm. But, uh, after he takes your account, I mean, you, I'm assuming you're going to tell him everything that you know, everything that happened. Yeah, which, you know, is a, is a finite amount, unless he, he wants me to go through my, uh, my, my, uh, drug-induced coma dreams. <laughs> but, um, the, uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> Marlo told him everything he knows, and then we try to get a bit of information out of him as well, in terms of, like, is this, this seems like it's been an ongoing problem, you know, does he think it's targeted, or are they just grabbing people at random? He's gonna say, uh, uh, it starts with the vulnerable. Homeless, refugees, people just sitting out in the streets. Sometimes they get ambitious, though. Raiding homes, raiding taverns, of the like. Account, uh, Fourteen people vanished since the crisis began. Uh, but how long ago was that? I think I said, um... I think I said it happened within the year. Yeah, like, uh, I, all, like, the destruction happened within the year, like, several, maybe several months ago. But it has, it, ha it, it definitely hasn't been, like, over a year. Like, it's been, like, maybe three seasons since it started been a little bit, not gonna lie. And things seemingly have only gotten worse. Hmm. One thing you will say, though, is that uh, it's usually hard to find a scent for them, because they uh, they seem to, like, douse their, their clothes. Like, you know, they, they, they basically saturate their clothes with the smell of, uh, of wood smoke. Like, burnt wood, like burnt charcoal. And being that, you know, the main bit about, you know, Northern Geloy is logging... There's always someone burning charcoal somewhere, or burning coal, like, somewhere. It's always, it's just, like, an ever-present thing. Like, one of the things you'll notice about, uh, about Nornheim, I don't, I don't remember, uh, I don't remember, like, I don't know if you guys remember my description of it, but, uh, like, the whole, the whole, basically the whole area, like, above the city is just, like, it's just, like, com almost completely obscured with the, like, you know, the, the, like, you know, the, uh, the remains, like, the just smoke that's being burned, like, from, like, burned wood. Because, like, one of the major exports from this area is charcoal. Because, of course, you have to make that. But, uh, yeah, he'll tell you that it's... it's they're, they're very crafty. And uh, they are hard to, to track. And so far, they just haven't been able to, to get them. They've been able to, like... They've been able to essentially catch them in the axe sometimes. So the, the, the would be the, the people who would have also like been taken away would have exceeded 14 had they not been able to stop them at some points. But uh, but no, there's, it's, they've just been very, very difficult to track, unfortunately. And um, yeah, Marlo would, of course mention that they, they used you know some sort of uh, you know solution or whatever to knock him out. Um, is that something that they've looked into trying to track? Uh, yeah, they ha definitely have. They definitely have. Um, the... They do, they are, they have, like, consulted, like, you know, alchemists on the behest of the Count to find out what kind of solution it is. 
and they have been able to identify that it is essence of ether. But um, they don't. They don't. They're not really sure where they would get it from. They've uh, they've questioned the local like herbalists and alchemists that live in Nornheim, and in fact, they've even gone so far as to put them under house arrest, as to like ensure that they haven't been doing anything to even like essentially do everything short of outwards like, outright spying on them just to make sure that they aren't like you know harming anybody but uh they've they've all they've all come clean they've all shown that they have nothing to hide and it just seems that they they, they don't seem to be contributing to the crisis so <clears throat> we can only assume that uh, they're getting what they're getting because i mean essence of ether is expensive they seem to be just getting it from like an outside source mm-hmm Does Marlowe kind of fit the description of most of these kidnapped victims, or is, uh, like I'm thinking, are they? Is it mostly all the elderly women and children being kidnapped, or is it like everyone of uh, of all genders and ages? Uh, it definitely is. They'll say like, um, well, the hun- the houndsman will say, uh, oh, it seems that they prey on the youth, not like small children, but." Young adults, usually. Mm. Some female, some male, but most young. Fairly young. Hmm. <clears throat> Maybe something tying them, tying them together, if anyone in that age range. Yeah, well, into that. That's not the easiest uh, of I targets, know. so... They, they may be needing that age range for a specific reason Mm -hmm, for purpose yes can you give me one second Uh, I just want to check something I'll give you several (laughs) hmm interesting we are not actually wait yeah we're not actually live on Facebook, which doesn't really matter, but that's very strange. Hold on, let me see if I can access. I'm doing it on my phone, by the way. Hold on, if this looks weird, anyway. Huh. Streamlabs is acting strange. Um, I'm gonna have to... I wish I'd have known it was gonna be acting strange before I went live, but we're not... I'm pretty sure we're live on... We're definitely live on Twitch, but it doesn't seem that we're live on Facebook or even YouTube. But, I mean, that doesn't... That doesn't matter. I can just post links, which is fine. Uh... Yeah, I'm gonna have to edit that. Whatever. All right. Unfortunate, it's OBS is has always been quite the fickle mit- mistress. But anyway, <laughs> let's just continue. All right, so uh, there we go. All right, so I mean, uh, yeah, I mean that's all he has to really tell you. Um, the way that it usually happens is that they chase them. They corner them seemingly and then they just disappear like as they're about to corner them sometimes they scale walls and jump over like buildings and when they go around to find like on the other side of said building they'll just be gone no sign no sign of any anything really Hmm. and uh would there be any chance that they could point us to like a specific place where they've they've disappeared in front of the guards before um, I mean, he can take you to some of the, uh, this, like, the places in the city that they have marked, but, uh, if you're thinking that they might be interconnected in some way, then he'll just tell you that, like, it doesn't seem that they are. It's, it really is just, like, random parts of the city. Like, it, it's, it's, it's definitely around areas with people in them, but, um, in terms of, like, a pattern, doesn't seem to be one. Well, uh, Marlowe has that, like, pendant uh, thing that the the watch 
Master, I think, was his title. Um, or Captain of the Watch, one of those. Uh, oh, yeah. Gave to him yeah, in, yeah, order yeah. To, uh, in order to, to see meet him. with him, so. Yeah. Marla would uh, basically let uh, let their employer know to, to settle in and... Um, Wait for you to... Like, yeah. Yeah, right. Though... He has a personal score to settle, but uh, he should be able to maybe leverage dealing with this into a ticket out of the city. So, so just hold tight for now, and we'll see what we can do about getting getting a move on. You got it. You got it. All right. <clears throat> so I'm assuming from there you guys will be probably heading to the, to the sort of... The, the main guard outpost for the city, for the city watch. This sort of HQ. Yeah. Can you see why not? All right, you got it. So, uh, on our way there, is I'm just wondering, is there maybe like a kind of chemist, alchemist, kind of potions master somewhere in the city? Uh, I will tell you, but uh, just before you guys leave, mm -hmm. Doran is going to let you guys know that um, he's going to say, uh, Gentlemen, I... Well, I'd hate to break the spirit of the mood, but uh, I must admit that this journey has so far taken more time and resources than I had originally believed it would. And uh, I'm afraid to say if we don't find a way to leave soon, then I'm going to really start running out of money. The fiasco in Southern Galloway dealing with Martin Oka already had strained my previous planning. I believed that if we had just simply left the same, almost the same day that we arrived at Nornheim, that we would make good time, but we are way behind schedule, unfortunately. Well, I understand your situation. I hear you. I empathize with you. <laughs> but your hold has been there for how many thousands of years? And he's, I mean, he'll sort of count on his fingers for a second and uh, <laughs> just he'll just realize that, you know, what you're trying to say. He's, he's just going to say, uh, just, just letting you know. I hope to have this done within my lifetime, I'll just say. <laughs> yes, well, I'm under significantly more pressure on that front than you are, but uh, I understand your points. Just try not to fret too much about time and money. We've got plenty of time, and you're resourceful enough to get more money. There's uh, plenty of trouble around and trouble pays but we did promise to get you there and we'll do our best to get you there as quickly as possible and, uh, I mean he'll feel thank all you we can do it. yeah he'll feel thank you and say that that's all he really asked for it and that uh, he'll be he'll be here trying to you know taking scope of the city maybe trying to find uh, see if there's any more places of interest that are about but uh Alright, if you are heading towards the, uh, if you are heading towards the main guard building, where they, the captain of the guard barrack and organize, it will take you across the, uh, the city, and it will also take you past the, uh, the, from where the Croc and Miller is, the mighty bastion that is the, uh, that is, what did I call it? Uh, that is Whitehorn Keep, as you will be... Uh, well, as, like, you know, street signs will tell you. And uh, what you see in front of Whitehorn Keep is actually an, uh, an angry mob. An angry... seems to be, like, an angry group of people who are outside with, uh, not, like, pitchforks and torches, but just, like, a, a gathering of people. There's, like, an antagonist. And is that the word? Uh, Someone who's like in sort of egging them on, to sort of like sort of trying to rouse their uh, their frustrations, that sort of thing. Someone like mm. uh, like you know shouting chants and whatnot. Uh, rabble rousing. 
Exactly. Uh, interesting. I did not put this in my... Uh, wait. Yeah, interesting. I did not put this in my planner for this session, but I swear that it... I definitely meant to. So I'm just going to play off the cuff here, unfortunately. The, uh, the mob are essentially... Like, you know, you'll hear a lot of people saying, like, uh, we want to trade, we want to trade, etc. Like, you know, or open up the gates and what you can gather based on what they're chanting and, like, what they're, like, yelling towards the guards who are on the battlements of the keep. The keep is surrounded by a moat, so there's only, like, one way to get in based on the, uh, a, like, a, draw, you know, a drawbridge mechanism that allows you access from the other side. They're just watching, you know, some of them have, like, you know, uh, crossbows at the ready, but uh, they're just watching, just watching it, essentially the, the angry mob just state their, state their uh, grievances and whatnot, and uh, a man with uh, what appears, to basically is a megaphone without, you know, a rudimentary one without all the, you know, machinery, I guess, just, a, just basically like a wooden cone with like a fucking handle on it. He's just shouting like, as, like, you know, his lungs out at the guards on the battlement saying things like, uh, basically, t like, lambasting them for the fact that they don't have to, and they basically don't have to endanger themselves truly for a living. Like, you know, they're the ones who have to go out and trade. They're the ones that keep this, uh, city running. That this city is essentially built on the passage of goods from one area to another, so. People eventually are going to start losing their livelihoods, unfortunately. They are quite upset. Uh, you guys, if you want, can interject in some sort of way, but I'm going to suspect that you're not really going to. I would say just uh, kind of quietly tomorrow, like, Duh. but they're kind of under threat of death. Is the threat <clears throat> of death really worth all that money? I understand our lives are in, dan are in danger, but to be fair, their lives are going to be in danger with this current crisis going on. Yes, but... Uh... You also have to understand that many of them probably haven't ever seen a tar or monster firsthand, but they have seen, you know, friends or family starve when money isn't uh, brought in. So mm. for them, it's the, the more pressing of two concerns. Oh, I see. Never thought. I never thought of it like that before. It's hard to ask someone to be afraid of monsters when they're starving. Hmm. Fair. <clears throat> or maybe it's greed. I don't know these people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that the crowd is particularly bourgeois. You can definitely tell. A lot of them are like they look to be city people. They are fairly well dressed. They're tradespeople. The functional middle class, quote unquote, of the, I guess, medieval to ish rena uh, Renaissance ish era. So you know, they do look to be of quite higher standing. Which also is, which it says something about, uh, I guess, the prosperity of Nornheim, since most of the people that live in the city seem to be living relatively well. But I mean, that that's what it is with most cities, isn't it? The disparage, like the disparity, I guess, between living standards is usually quite large. But anyway, you guys continue to the guard outpost. <clears throat> Alright, so the captain of the guard is willing to meet with you, the guards who are watching the uh, outpost itself, the outside of it. It's a sort of like a walled off. It's basically like a. Oh, it's, you know, if you've ever seen, like, an embassy before, like, you know, how they're sort of, like, walled off and fenced off with, like, high fences? Mm -hmm. Same thing. Just, you know, to, I guess, protect anybody who's being uh, held there or whatever. But uh, John Murlock, as I have mentioned his name to be before, he is within his quarters, and he's willing to see you. He's going to, you know, open up, obviously, he's going to let you in and say, uh, he's going to say, uh, 
I'll have you know that, um, well, you, if you have means to stay in Nornheim, you should not worry about the Tars. I, I know how asinine that may sound, seeing as you are nearly kidnapped, but we are working diligently, I... I am curious, though, what is your interest in these creatures? <clears throat> oh. Well, aside from feeling personally slighted by their actions, uh, we have encountered them uh, numerous times on our trip here and had uh, more than our, our fair share of scuffles with them. Uh, obviously, all of which we have uh, emerged the the victor, but they leave worrisome clues behind. They're working towards something larger than just the Tars, and I believe that they uh, certainly pose pose a threat to the countryside. Maybe even a significant threat to your city here if they're allowed to succeed with whatever it is they're doing yes we found several obelisks and them committing almost demonic rituals if you were so i i we me personally i think that they might be trying to summon an even greater evil than themselves <clears throat> and he's gonna ask you he's gonna say uh you you gentlemen You've passed through, well, have you passed through what remains of Gedeby? And uh, he's referring to the, the town where, where you had initially received your, uh, your title of Beast Slayer from the, the spirits that had remained after it was despoiled. Yes, we, uh, we avenged a good number of the people who had died there. And he's going to... That's going to bring a sort of, um... Is he, I mean, it's, he's gonna be taking someone back to it, but not, like, in, in an offended way, but just sort of, like, really, just just the two of you guys. Like, uh, interesting. And he's gonna... Nope. Wait, what happened? I was gonna say, it was more, it was more, a uh, symbolic victory. It was, a uh, It was one through one-on-one -on -one combat between me and, uh, the tour leader. Uh, yes, but, uh, they certainly ran quickly when they tried to rally against you. <laughs> yes, I guess they didn't, they didn't want to be the next one with their head removed. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, he's gonna obviously be quite surprised by that, like I said. And... Uh, he's going to tell you that, um... We have... We are aware of that event that transpired. Um... That was actually the the first strike against us. The first, I guess, the first play that they've made against us was the destruction of Gettysby. Of Gettysby, excuse me. Obviously, we have not recovered, seeing as that it is still in ruins. And uh, I must say, it is. I am quite surprised. Very surprised. And, uh, I mean, I do know some people who I respected from Gedeby. And to know that, in some way, they have been avenged, I should say, it, it raises my spirits, which. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm looking at my cat, which is just like. Sp she's like sprawled on the floor because I guess it's so hot. And she's, like, contorted in this really weird way. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it looks like someone just, like, twisted a, a fucking, like, hand towel on the ground. Yeah, my cat used to do that, but now that she's older, she just does the leg tip, leg tucks. Yeah. She's yeah. too, too regal and sophisticated now for the, just flipping on the ground. <laughs> exactly. But anyway. <clears throat> He's going to say, uh... I do thank you. I do thank you for what you've done against the Tars, and I'm sorry for, for doubting you before. It's not every day that people who are 
genuinely determined to see that her destruction come into town. Though, the Count has done much to bolster our defenses against them. Speaking of the Count, I uh, am afraid this is where my sense of duty must interject with my genuine interest in you two. Under the orders of the Count, and uh, you must understand it is an order that I believe is reasonable, he has said that anyone who inquires deeply about the Tars, before I am to divulge with them any more information that I know, and any more information that I am willing to share, I've heard that you've talked with my houndsman, that I have them sent to him. Now, uh, uh, forgive me, I do not mean to send you in circles. I had simply... I had simply assumed that you were just concerned citizens, which is why I had allowed you to... come here first. <clears throat> I don't have a problem with this. It's not like we're going to be going anywhere anytime soon, it seems. He says, uh... The... The Count has been working hard to see that this threat does not overtake every aspect of our way of life. The closing of the Northern Gate was one of his more drastic actions, I'd say, but it wasn't an easy one, of course, as you are able to tell based on what is going on in front of Whitehorn. The people here are restive. They do not necessarily agree with every aspect of his rule and his dealing with this travesty. But you must understand that he... I put much trust in Totenmeyer. And I am forced to say, if we are to work together, that you must see him first. It is easy enough, and he's going to give you a... He's going to, you know, dip a a pen that he pulls out from a small desk, well, from the desk that he's sitting at, writing a small, you know, just a small bit of writing. He just, like, sort of dips in the ink and just scrawls it on the paper. Then he takes uh, some, uh, a stamp and, like, sort of stamps in a, uh, well, he just, he dips it in ink, obviously, and stamps it in on the uh, piece of paper, revealing a, a crest but like that is, like, like, upon seeing the crest, you'll notice that it is also like a lot part of a lot of the iconography that you've seen all around the uh, the city itself. A lot of it bearing. Uh, damn, I actually never, I've never actually added that to any bit of lore. What the I guess crest of arms of the city is. I can let me come with it on the spot. Let me see. Well, let me let me get the old noggin jargon. Uh, it is a. It is. It is white and it is white and red. It is an image of a like a sort of like a a, a fanciful image of a tree and with a, a pair of swords crossed behind it. There we go. Yeah, there we go. It's a pair of swords crossed behind a tree. And this is the symbol of Nornheim as a governmental body. And he'll give that to you. Mm -hmm. he'll, he'll say that all you need to do is just show it to the guards, they'll mm -hmm. yell to draw down, you know, drop down the bridge, Ooh. and etc. If someone's at the door, I've got to go, I'll be right back. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. No worries, I'm going to take a sip of this water. Hydration is important. Exactly. Let me see if I can mess with my cat here. I guess it's too hot, so that's he's just like lying on the floor. <laughs> oh, I'd love to get a cat. Yeah, they're not I want a dog like a cat and a cat like a dog. Yeah, they're not they're not really high maintenance at all, really. Which I knew from the get go, but like I, I didn't think that they would be this low maintenance. Yeah. All they do is sleep all day. That's really all they do. <laughs> Easy to take care of. Exactly, and they seem to just, like, know. They just know what to do, like, in every situation, it seems. 
Like, when they want to eat, they'll obviously, like, go to where they're fed, and if they want to go, just do, like, I guess go outside, they'll just go where a window is and just, like, fucking rip up the curtains or whatever. <laughs> no, they, they are very fun. It is nice having a cat. It was, it's also really cool because, um... Like, uh, one of the things that she, she sometimes does is that she, she chases around squirrels. And, yeah. Yeah, and my, and my, and my father in particular likes that because they tend to rip up our lawn. So whenever she does that, like, it's usually, it's usually, it's usually in service to a good cause, I'd say. <laughs> She's a good murder kitty. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna obviously we're, we'll start back up when Scotty gets here. No worries. But uh, one of the things that I've also been doing during this uh, this quarantine, because I mean it's still going on, nothing's really changed. Is um is I've actually started like you know, for some for some reason it's been not easy even though it's. It was easier for me in the past, but I've actually been growing like you know herbs and shit. Oh, nice! Yeah, I've been growing. Uh, I've been growing chamomile and um, and uh, and lemon basil because I want to mix them and make them into tea. Okay, what, what what was the first thing you said? I don't think I've ever heard of it. Uh, chamomile. It is a it is a plant. It is used for like um, it is um. Is it sweet? Let's think. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's 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 a flower. It's a very. It's floral. It smells nice. Oh, I think my nephew yeah. did something wrong. Apparently. But uh, it's floral. It's it's fra very fragrant. It smells very very nice. Like the flower itself. Like y if you like mash it up, you can take the oils and like you know, you know, uh, turn it into like you know. Well, it, it, they don't have any, they don't necessarily have any, like, you know, like, it's not like aloe, where you can just, like, slap it on your skin and it actually helps with burns. It's, like, it's mainly meant to, like, make things smell nicer, so you can turn it into perfume and whatnot. Okay, that's cool. But the main thing is, is that people like to do is that they like to dry it out, and they like to steep it and turn it into tea. And it's a very, it's, yeah, it's a very, I mean, personally, I think it just yeah. tastes good, but it's, it's, for some people, they think it's, like, really soothing. That sounds nice. I, very similar to my sister's also been uh, starting to grow stuff like uh, particularly uh, celery and green onions. So that's nice to add to a soup every now and again. Exactly. Fre fresh, cel fresh celery. I actually have it right here. If, uh, I'm going to tip it towards the camera so people can see it. Mm. But it is growing very nicely. And it was... Oh, Scotty's back. i got to pull away from this. i got to hide the weed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Quick, eat the drugs. All right. All right. So he's going to give you that uh, sort of writ of passage, and he's gonna—I mean, that's all he really has to say. So he'll send you on your merry way to Whitehorn Keep. Mm -hmm. I got no. Yeah, I got no problem going there right away. All right. Mm -hmm. So you'll see. You return, obviously, to the angry mob. And one thing that you see is uh, you also see the the uh, the adventuring group that you had met in the the Crockin' Miller. And that's the name of it. The Keepers of the Hammer with their little dwarf, their little human, and the uh, wood elf. And, uh, nice. Are they just... Yeah, I don't know. The, oh, no, I was just going to ask if they were just uh, like part of the mob or they seem to be guarding someone or just hang, watching the show. The, the cleric, the human, who is uh, quite a fan of your your work, Connor. <laughs> for for a hundred percent racial reasons, is uh, going to, he's gonna basically like come up to you and say, uh, "Oh, it's it's very nice to see you again, Mister Connor." Yeah, yeah, see you as well. Oh, yeah. So what what brings you to uh, to Nornheim in the first place? He's going to say, uh, "Well, we're adventurers, like we said." Um, we heard, well, we received a missive from this, uh, this Count Totenmeyer guy, whatever his name is, that, uh, they need people to help out the situation that's apparently going on, so we, we came in. There's a teleportation circle in the 
church apparently that's here, the Holy Congregation. We came in and we were here to help. Oh, it's good to know. Well, very good. Well, hopefully you're able to do such a thing. We're actually on our way to uh, to talk. I think we're on our way to talk to the Count as we speak. The... Were you aware of uh, Were you aware of what happened to, to my friend Marlo after, last night? And they all say no. They they've haven't heard anything. Well, I don't don't mean to don't mean to speak for him. Uh, <clears throat> Marlo cleared his throat and go well. There was a rather exciting uh, attempted kidnapping of me last night. I, I slept through most of it, but I hear it was uh, quite the spectacle. The uh, the druid, the wood elf druid, is going to is going to be like, oh, you poor dear. I hope they haven't. Uh, well, they have they taken anything from you? Are you? She's going to basically even ask if you're all right, if you need anything. Um, no, no, luckily the guards, uh, intercepted them, uh, otherwise I'd be spirited away, but this is not the first time I've been, uh, drugged and transported, so, I'm no stranger to it, perhaps I'm not as, uh, disturbed as I should be, but, uh, I would, I would quite like to see that it doesn't happen to anyone else, as it, uh, is apparently a reoccurring problem in these parts, though... Breaking into the tavern uh, seems bold, but perhaps they're just getting uh, more and more brazen. <clears throat> the, uh, what was I going to say? Damn it. Um, uh, the, the, the dwarf will say, uh, it seems that we have our work cut out for us. Quite. Be, ca be careful out there. Keep an eye out. Yeah, they're all gonna agree with you, and uh, they're going to uh, present the writ that they were given to the guards. And uh, it's it's quite different from what you have. It's uh, it's actually it has a very um, it has a very it's also like you know obviously written on a paper with a seal like a, a seal made of red ink. The seal itself is uh, a, like a, a of a different design, but the guard instantly recognizes it, and or it takes him a little bit, but he he recognizes it and calls for the drawbridge to be uh, brought down. The human, like you know, the cleric that I mentioned, uh, I told you about, he's gonna he's gonna also let them know that your guys are coming with. At first, the guard's gonna interject, saying that you know we haven't, we're only expecting you guys, but. Uh, they're going to say he's going to say that uh, he's basically just going to like vouch for you and say like oh well now you have more and stuff like that. Oh yeah, well, are, are, were these the people that we were supposed to uh, show our own right for? Well, yeah, like they they just like happen to go first. If you want to show him the the thing that you were given, mm. like by the we have a letter. <laughs> I mean, he'll he'll just look over your, the. Uh, the writ that you were given by the captain of the guard, and he'll, of course, let you in as well. Commenting that, uh, that these are truly interesting circumstances. Because it's fairly obvious that you guys are above the rank and file, I should say. But, uh, they, the drawbridge is let down, and you get to finally bear witness to the, the real splendor that is Whitehorn Keep. It is quite the mighty bastion. It's like I said, I mentioned it's surrounded by a moat. At the bottom of that moat, you can see in the water, as you walk across the drawbridge, it is teeming with wooden stakes. As you were let inside, you see on the battlements, the, our, uh, on, the, on the battlement has several men garbed in plate mail, or plate or chain, depending on uh, which one you're looking at. And atop every turret that you see is a pair of ballista. And uh, as you continue on, you notice that it is very well constructed. Every arrow slit has a function. It's allowing arcs of fire along every angle of approach. It's tall and every sort of... Like, the walls themselves are tall enough so that even a giant may struggle to scale them. And uh, inside, you see a courtyard filled with finely cut shrubbery, beautiful stained glass, expertly chiseled col uh, <coughs> columns. 
and uh, cobble pathways indicating a dual purpose, I should say. This is not only a fortress, but it is a count's seat of power. You are meant to feel inspired by it. Uh, just as mere existence is a show of power and prestige and wealth. Hmm. But in truth, it is a resplendent mash between citadel and resplendent cathedral. It's a glorious visage defiant... Uh, Jesus, I can speak English if I try. Its glorious visage uh, defiantly juts into the sky and is topped with a giant horn of pearly white that snakes from the highest tower and wraps around its heft. Alright, so... The guard who sort of leads you in, he hands you off to a uh, what you can only assume, assume to be a custodian, a man in finely, like a fine clothing. He holds like a sort of a, a staff, which seems to be his little badge of office. And uh, he introduces himself as uh, Menthes, custodian Menthes, and he will guide you into the courtroom. Rather, the, well, the, the courtroom, the throne room. It's, it's not absolutely ginormous, so it's, it's the same thing. Think of, like, you know, the think of where you first met Jarl Balgriff or whatever in, Dragon, in Dragon's Reach. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. All right, so... You are allowed through a set of very large doors, large wooden doors, and at the head of a long table, s and sat down at each of its six seats is a man in fine... Well, it, it, at each of the six seats is a man in fine dress or armor, and at the head is who you can only seem to be the Count themselves. They are also in armor. But uh, at the very top of their helm is a... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me is a uh, wrought from gold it is a sort of uh it appears to be some sort of like a structure that r resembles a a tree like an oak tree there's also like some bits of plumage like you know some like very colorful feathers also coming out of their uh, helmet it it just it just screams high prestige you get the idea <laughs> but uh each of the men in the seats at the count's table, you know, this long table, they all, you know, look at you as you approach, and the count introduces himself as Count Eric Totenmeier. He says, uh, I was expecting a group of three. And again, the human cleric, he vouches for you guys, saying that uh, you also have business with the count. The druid, in particular, she says, uh, My count, you're looking at the dungeon attack squad. And the, the count sort of uh, impressed to a good degree because the name is quite fetching. <laughs> of course. And Marlo will, um, you know, do the, do the proper bow, uh, and then he will go, Marlo Albright and uh, companion uh, and hero. Uh, Connor, the Beast Slayer. Well, of course, uh, bat bow as well. And after the bow, Marla will say, At your service, uh, we're here to help resolve the issue with Tars in your city. He's going to say, uh, Very, very good to hear. Very good to hear. And, uh, He's going to address the Keepers of the Hammer first. And uh, he'll come off his throne to meet them. And uh, I'm not going to like do a whole back and forth. They converse very shortly. And uh, the Count offers them a test of their skills, telling them, telling them to bring him the horns of ten tars and be granted gold for each so that he may know that they are truly... Uh, now that they are true, you know, truly well-skilled at what they do. That, he, that they're essentially useful. You, you, know, you guys know what it, the drill. They're competent. Exactly. If they come back alive, then you will give them more to do. Fingers crossed for them. Exactly. They will, of course, accept. They will, uh, you know, they'll... Obviously quite excited for the future. The, the cleric will uh, nudge you on the shoulder, Connor, and say, uh, Wish me luck out there. And good luck to you guys, too. Yes. Break a leg. May you return safely. 
All right. He'll also, the Count will also tell them, I, I kind of did this out of order, but he'll essentially tell them that the the main threat of the TARS appears to be coalescing around the north, so if they are competent, then they will easily find them and bring them uh, bring him back three horns. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, the Count will request that you guys present yourselves before him. Your Excellency, we were sent by uh, by our captain of guard, Dor John Murlock. Yes. Murlock, was it? Yes. Very bad with names myself, I am. Uh, my friend Marlo here was kidnapped by Tors last night, and we are aware that such abductions have become more commonplace in the city. Uh, we merely wish to offer our services to assist to bring and into this crisis uh, very soon, if not uh, permission, if you would, to exit to the north. And he's going to, um, the whole time you were explaining that to him, he was sort of looking you up and down, but uh, where his eyes rest, even while you're speaking, like towards the latter half of your little uh, spiel, his eyes rest on the on the uh, the fang biter, and mm. uh, he's going to uh, he's going to sort of make a hand motion, and you're going to see uh, the guards that are stationed at the basically at each pillar. There's about four of them, and the and you'll see ones at the far end of the court at like you know at, at a set of doors that are on either side of his throne. They're gonna sort of uh, they're gonna basically like. Uh, Almost like make ready like they're about to assail you guys. And he's going to uh This is this is quite visible. That's not it's not like, you know, he's not hiding it. Some some of them will like sort of shuffle very slowly into position around you guys. And he's going to uh he's gonna say to you, Connor. I will only ask you this once, Dragonborn. Where did you get that sword? I know not much of the politicking of my southern kin, but I know for a fact that is the sword of Alistair Bradley, the Fangbiter. So either you are a grave robber, or worse. Hmm. I prefer not to think of myself as a grave robber, but I suppose there truly is no other definition that I can come to. Originally, I had taken this weapon to give to another uh, to learn that it becomes lighter with the more... I forget the exact legend, but the, it's much more easier to wield for those who are worthy. Yeah, to so those and, who are pure of heart, it is uh, easier to wield. But to, for those who are, I guess, uh, lesser, it becomes as if it were lead. Right, it, it becomes hmm. lead-like. Yes. So those with the darkest of hearts may we find a difficulty wielding this sword. While I took this sword, uh, and my employer had, had problems, I had no such qualms, and my employer relinquished control of the sword to me. I believe this sword can help me do great good in this world, and I intend to fully intend to bring it back to its gravesite once I'm able to find a heroic weapon of which I can call my own. Because I consider this a weapon to be borrowed property. <clears throat> he's going to, uh... I mean, he's going to... You can tell that he sees that you are being truthful. Or he... Like, as you speak and explain your story, he, uh... Sort of eases up his, uh... His sword arm becomes less uh, sort of oriented around the sword on his belt, and uh, he is—he just becomes more relaxed, and he sort of motions for the rest of the guards for to go back to their posts. And he says, uh, "For you to be trusted with such an important relic of the southern folk." You must be quite the capable band. Well, I do 
I do try to do my best, King Grace. And he says, Oh, fine then. Uh, well, hold, on, hold on. And he's going to essentially go back to his throne. You know, all the guards are going to go back to their posts and say, and he's going to tell you, um, So, the Beast Slayer. Have you been fighting these beasts long? We've had, I look, tomorrow, three? Three such encounters, I believe? Mm. Or te Indeed, technically uh, four. Yes, there was there was the, the village in which you garnered that title. Uh, yes. Then there was... Um, the sure shots, the ambush the skirmish sure shots. with the sure shots. Um, the uh, incident at the watchtower, and then yes. the, uh, the obelisk in the woods. Oh, okay, and then including yesterday must have been f that's five then. Yes, five that would be ago. that'd be five encounters, four uh, in which we um, traded blows, yeah. Yes, and and emerged uh, totally victorious. Uh, the last one, um, that one doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough, but he uh, he will say. Uh, Five such encounters with these beasts. Very impressive. Praise to you, Beast Slayer. May your slaying of these beasts be... will be great and long... and, uh, Jesus, I had the exact word in my head. God damn it. But he's going to say, uh, May your work be grand, and may you slay many Tars as you venture throughout Northern Galloway. I will, of course, get the bow and say, I shall do all that I can, Your Grace. Now then, I will tell you what I know, heroes. First, I shall say that I offer my blessing to you to further this investigation, if you so please. Well, if, yeah, if you so please. The source of the kidnappings, again, I am sure it has to do with the Tar's work against this realm. I will offer all the insight that I have, but just know that I have had the sewers scoured and all the darker nooks and crannies of this city Essentially unearthed, it does not seem that the Tars are acting independently, I should say. In fact, I believe that this, this crisis may be a conspiracy against this entire realm. Hmm. I can't help but think of the, the mob that was outside the northern gates. You believe maybe some of their leaders, some rabble-rousers might be... Uh might be in league with these Tars, let them in. And he says, oh, it is... It is... I will not say it is likely, but it is definitely possible. The... Hold on, let me think of what I'm going to say here. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, all right. Hold on, let me just see where I am in my notes. Okay, I am I'm at the right spot. All right. He will say, uh, <clears throat> if and you have... Well, no, he'll, he'll, he'll address what you said, like, he's not really sure. But he'll, he'll say, um, I fear that one of our own amongst my court or the lessers amongst my court may have something to do with it as well. There are rules, of course, within the politicking of this realm. The nobles amongst us pride, us pride ourselves in our privacy and the rights that we have to our land. I cannot simply uproot every single manor house, every single abode, the nobles of this fair city reside in, you understand. 
Though we are in a crisis, we must respect one another as citizens. While the transfer to power I have, I will not get into my full history, as esteemed as I believe it is, it is not unlikely that I have surely garnered a, a series of enemies, but I don't believe any of them would be as foolish as to throw in their lot with creatures such as these. But again, anything is possible. Now, I give you my blessing to the captain of the guard, and he will take the, uh, you know, he'll take the writ that the captain gave you and uh, order one of his uh, pages to sort of put his own personal seal on it, indicating that you have his permission. Whew. It is really hot. Jesus, I'm starting to light it. Mm. And he'll also say, uh, alternatively, I have something that you can do for me, something that is a little more, well, it will require a bit more, how should I say, uh, rigorous activity, if you will. And it is related to what we are doing here in Geloy. Or rather in Nornheim, excuse me. Mm. So he is willing to hey. explain, he's willing to explain that if you are interested in also helping him in that way. Hmm. Well, we are on not, a, not quite a horrible time crunch, but time is a factor to us. We would be willing to, I, personally, I'd be willing to at least hear out what you have in mind and possibly help you out if, uh, if, t if time would permit. What do you think, Marlo? Uh, yes, I'm curious to at least uh, hear what it is. It could prove uh, less time-consuming than hunting for uh, shape changers in a city. Mm. And he, and he, well, excuse me. What he will say is, um, <clears throat> are you gentlemen eager to leave Nornheim? Are you on some sort of a schedule? Our employer, uh, Durin, is very keen to get north. He's a scholar who believes he's found an ancient uh, dwarven keep. And he says, interesting, very interesting. And he says, um, <clears throat> I tell you what. And uh, he will get one of his pages, and he'll sort of whisper some information to into his ear. And he'll the page will sort of like hurry off. I'm assuming your employer. He is. Well, he. Jesus, let me let me actually use my words. He says, "I assume your employer has some sort of a investment." In this quest, has he brought any supplies? Is he, is he staying at the Croc and Miller? Is he making use of its uh, stables in any way? Well, we did come with a horse, yes, we or a cart at least, and we are staying at the Croc and Miller. I think, I think he's most concerned of just uh, running out of funds to for basic necessities while we were, while we are in the city. Understandable. Then, if you are to commit to helping me, then I will see to it that your employer's needs are met. Of course, if you decide to assist me in the matters regarding this crisis, I will allow him to take his cart into Whitehorn Keep, and his horses shall be fed, and... His lodging shall be taken care of. Same as yourselves. Well, you'll, you'll, you'll just say same to same as yourselves as well. Turn tomorrow and said, "Like, well, you wouldn't hear him complaining much about that if we did this for him, would he?" No, I don't suppose he would. I know he's eager to get where he's going, but like I said, his archaeological dig site is not going anywhere. Yes. 
Well, Your Grace, we are certainly more than willing to listen to listen to your offer. And he says, uh, right. Like I said, this might be a bit more dangerous, but there is peculiar happenings in Northern Galloway, I should say. I feel that, well, this might be helpful in a particular way that we may not know of. I've had an interesting encounter in my bedchambers one night. A... Oh, bye. Ha! Huh, he says a... A feline, a cat. I do not own a cat. Well, we, we have mouses, but this is not a cat. I don't own any of them. I don't consider them pets. A cat, which has unaccounted for, somehow sneaked into my chambers one night, and I found... On its collar, some sort of a note. It said on it, I remember it fondly, in glistening letters, they seem to have been enchanted. The scrying order lends aid only to those who seek it. And on the other side of the note was a map for the nearby area. An area due northeast of Nordheim, deep in the forest. I've wa I would have sent one of my aides, but it is all hands on deck during this crisis, and I've been meeting to have someone investigate, of course. I assumed that this wasn't the work of any Tars, as, well, I, I don't know, the... I'll just say it, it felt peculiar. I, I felt as if whatever sent this creature, I, I believe it was a cat, though it had a particular twinkle in its eye, that perhaps it is worth investigating. Now, I can understand if you wish to stay within the city. And I do have the situation fairly under control. But my arcane advisor has advised me that this missive that I have been sent, if it is arcane in nature, then it definitely might be worth looking into. It seems that we might be having some support that might be even more powerful than we might have been anticipated, anticipating originally. Though I have sent word out to any adventuring groups that may wish to aid in this crisis. And how far north did you say this was, the, uh, the letter said? I'm going to drop an X on the map to show. Actually, hold on. We, we all know the X that's right here for, oh, whoopsie, for, for where we're actually going. But the X on the map, it uh, is marked right here. Okay. So. And, sorry, sorry, I'll just uh, use the ruler to show how far it is. Oh, right. okay. That is a full day's travel, though Tottenmeyer will explain how that forest, that section of uh, Northern Galloway is full of extremely dense forest, so... I mean, I'll just say mechanically that will register as the whole area essentially being difficult to rain. See. Hmm. Well, I think I would definitely be interested in accepting this offer. We may need to converse again with the uh, with with John and decide what our best move would be from there. Uh, Eric Totenmeyer, he explains a. Uh, if you do accept this quest, please do return. I I believe it is important. I do. <laughs> and so I would wish it that you men would, if in you are to, again, go on this quest, be as well equipped as possible. So, with that, he'll uh, leave you to do whatever it is that you plan to do. All right. I'll look tomorrow. I'll say, uh, 
And maybe I think we'll see John now, but I think this King's job, I think it could uh, buy both them and us a powerful ally to help us uh, help us with the tour problem within, within the city. I agree. Given that it's not a trap. Yes, well. If um if it is, then we'll we'll deal with it, I suppose. But uh I must confess I am I'm unsure where to begin looking for the tours tars and uh, as this if this group's name is accurate, divination magic could certainly prove easier than scouring the entire city. Yes, very, very true. So I guess we'll have this job as our as a most likely opportunity, but maybe talk to speak to John about it. Uh, yes, I would like to follow up with him, see yes. if we can get any more information about the situation in the city. Gotcha. But otherwise, we can uh, certainly uh, prepare to start heading up. <clears throat> All right. So. All right. So John Murlock. He is going to. Uh, he is going to explain that, uh, I mean, I'll waste no time. The, the Most of the angry mob has dispersed, but uh, they have they did say that they will be back. John Murlock. He, he explains to you men uh, that, um, you see, we, we do have the situation in Nornheim largely under control. If the Count does believe that this lead might help us in some particularly grand or magical way, if he does so believe, then I respect his judgment. Though I would certainly not mind your help, I shall leave it up to you. I, I will say, though, be careful venturing into those woods. It is quite dangerous. Oh, we know that quite well. But I think, uh, so Marlo, I think you and I are in agreement then that uh, this magical option may be the most convenient and effective way of helping the city of Nornheim with the Tor problem? Uh, yes. Hmm. Sounds good. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah, what what time is it right now in game? Uh, by now it is um, it is go uh, getting on to be uh, just after uh, you know noon, not mm. too long after noon. Yeah. All right. Well, if it takes a full day's travel, it might be. Considering one of us can see very poorly in the dark, uh, might be better to leave very early the next morning as opposed to leave right now. You got it. Hmm. All right. Um, Give me one second. Yeah. Hold on. Just got to update my notes a bit. There we go. All right. So, uh, I'm assuming you're also going to, like, let um, Doran know about uh, the offer to stay at Whitehorn. Yeah. Yeah. Doran is going to be quite relieved at that, because uh, the Crock and Miller, he he he's gonna say, uh, "In truth, I I know that I can find somewhere cheaper to stay in Nornheim, but woof, the food here is so good. It's fantastic, right? I mean, what did they do with those potatoes?" <laughs> he's uh, he is uh, very happy that you. Men have once again proven yourselves to be extremely useful. <laughs> well, probably have to just stay here for one more night before we're living in the lap of luxury and kind of keep it keeping this quiet to make sure nobody can really hear me. But like, keep maybe live in the lap of luxury, as it were. Fair enough. 
Uh, so I'm assuming you guys are going to go back to uh, Whitehorn in the morning. Um, in the morning, yeah, but I would say, like, in, during, like, if we have, if I have time for the rest of the day, I would definitely like to find a bookstore and a potions master. Barnes or and Noble. Of those lines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Barnes and Noble, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, ye old Barnes and Noble featuring ye old Starbucks. It's a... <laughs> Damn, I could actually go for a go for a fucking a hot chocolate. But anyway. Nice. Mm. I'm always more of a fan of mint, mint chocolate frappuccino. Uh, I don't really like coffee too much, even though they mm. do have like very nice, uh, you know, coffee like drinks. I don't. I try to just yeah. avoid coffee. But anyway. Yeah, no, I don't think frapp no frappuccinos don't have coffee because I'm not a fan of them either. Really? What is what is a frappuccino then? Oi. It's tasty. Um, <laughs> I think it's mostly just the. Uh, I think it's mostly just shredded ice and uh, and liquid. Oh, <laughs> all, oh, all those. Ingredients. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah, you. I've never actually. I don't know. I've never actually asked them like what goes in it. Yeah. No worries. Uh, maybe I'll I'll find out one day, or I'll just look it up after this, whatever. Mm. Anyway, all right. So. I mean, there is a the, the I guess the place of learning is uh, connected to the the main house of worship in this building, the, uh, where is it? God damn it. I had it here. Uh, hold on. I am just not organized, am I? Here it is. The, uh, the, the main sort of place where I guess people, like, get information, I guess, like, in a library. Jesus, I could have just said that. <laughs> is connected to uh, a temple known as Agatha's Rock. So it's basically like attached straight to the building. It does have a separate entrance, so if you do are you are you, if you're there literally just to see like, you know, the scribes of the cuz that's the, it's it's a it's an area where they compile knowledge obviously and it's also like, you know, a resource for the people and it's also like a repository for the scribes who live there. Yeah, we're going through like the main. No, I would say yeah, going through the main entrance of the, of the library, not like go through the temple if that's what you're saying. No, yeah, you, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you have that option. Yeah. Yeah, no, those go right, right, go straight to the library. Gotcha. So if I go in, uh, yeah, go. On. You know, I guess I would just mostly ask, whoever looks like they might work there or so, looking for. I'm looking for books, uh, specifically bestiaries of the north, as it were. So, like, of this local area? Yes. Yes, uh, farther north, maybe uh, in the neighboring continents, me and my companions are planning to be traveling quite a bit, so I like to be prepared. Gotcha. And, he's, and uh, the head scribe, you know, a, a man who is uh, quite sunken in the face... He's very old, you know, his uh, skin is, you know, you've, everyone's seen old people, but uh, this <laughs> man is uh, fairly stunted, and uh, sort of a, a pair of spectacles uh, are over his very long, sharply pointed, warty nose, and uh, his uh, saggy cheeks hang down f far, well, not, not far, but, you know, very close to his chin, and he uh, explains to you... Uh, Ah, the flora and fauna of Northern Gilroy. You're looking in particular for the flora. Well, no, that's that would be the fauna, I think. No. Wait, the, the, yep, yep, fauna. Fauna okay, is yeah, animals. Yeah, yeah, fauna is the animals. Yeah, yeah, okay. There is no end to the amount of information that we have on such matters. Oh. And, he, and he says, and he just sits down and... He says, I could bring you the resources we have, though you can just prod my brain. I have read most, if not all, of what we have here. Hmm. Well, yes, I'm uh, particularly interested in what might be the most, the most dangerous predators, as it were. The, the, the creatures that I don't want to run into in a dark alley. <laughs> He's going to say, uh, for some time in Geloy's history, specifically Northern Geloy, 
we have historically been confronted with forest goblins. Though, due to, thanks to the formation of the Emerald Knights, who have gone on many great scourings of their hovels, the natural fauna has been allowed to propagate normally once again. In terms of dangerous beasts, which may stalk the darker corners of its mighty forests, northern Galoi, or the as the area is more aptly called the Great Forest, is mostly native to its most terrifying creature, or the most terrifying creature in terms of frequency of its attacks. The, damn it, I had the word in my head. The, the uh, the far no there, there we go the far northern brown bear. Mm. Of course. Yes, I'm, not I'm sure I would meet a. I'm yeah. sure I would meet a grisly fate if <laughs> I were to meet him. These bears are very territorial, and the huntsmen of Geloy do their best to respect their holdings. They are quite smart as well, as they mark their territory typically by scratching large, well, just scratching large marks into nearby trees. They are quite large and quite dangerous. It is best that you not wander into their territories. Yes. Um, I remember hearing le legends of, you know, if you were to meet a brown bear, it's best to slowly back away or play dead. Is there any truth to this? And he says, the far northern brown bear, at least the ones that have settled in northern Galloway, are a bit more smarter than that. They are mainly focused on their territories. If you encroach on where they live, they will attack. If you keep your distance, they will leave you alone. Far mysterious, more mysteriously, I should say, there have been stories of men who have accidentally stumbled into their stomping grounds, and upon leaving, the brown bears simply leave them alone. But this rule is quite strict even amongst them. It seems that... They will, if you were to leave their boundaries, simply pace the area around the edges of their grounds and will only wait for you to attempt to tr trespass again. But if you were to respect their holdings, they will simply leave you alone. Hmm. Good to know. Yes, I... I always prefer animal beasts to monsters. At least beasts can have more of a live and let live mentality than some other creatures I've met. And he's, uh, you will continue by saying, of course, there is also the occasional unfortunate occurrence of a spat of owl bear activity. Owl mm -hmm. bears are not common, not common even slightly, but. It is on occasion that they may migrate from the even farther northern parts into northern Geloi. They are quite invasive. Of course, they, they are even more dangerous than the far northern brown bear, to where they will even hunt them down in their own caves or their own hovels. Hmm. Quite unfortunate. These beasts... Though very, very dangerous in the right circumstances, or in the wrong circumstances, depending on who you are. <laughs> they are quite noble. The uh, Emerald Knights, as they are called, venerate them as extensions of themselves, protectors of the forest. And uh, 
at some parts he will sort of gab on about, like, you know, information that you might not have asked about, but uh, going into even finer details, but uh, at some point he will say, uh, I, you, you get the point of what I'm <laughs> Yes. To. Hmm. That's very good. Um, and I guess, given the recent tour attacks have been uh, so prolific, you might know if, uh, if there are certain creatures that might ally themselves with uh, such tours. And he says, uh, oh, my friend. Well, the Tars are not common to get away, if you can believe it. We have known them to ally with any matter of evil creature that decides to find common cause with them, whether they be wyverns, uh, what's the, what's the one, manticores, there are others, but, um, I can't actually think of them. So, I'm just going to say, since I can't think of them, then that's main, the main ones, I should say. It's, it's mm -hmm. rare, of course, but, uh, not unheard of. The Tars are quite antagonistic creatures. They seek their own names. I see. And I've met three species of Tors. Are, are there others you're aware of? Uh, give me one second. <laughs> and he'll he'll just go through like describing each one that you've like you know encountered, and based on the ones that he's describing, you know it doesn't really seem like you've uh, encountered anything different. Uh, he'll just sort of list them all, and uh, he'll say, um, There is the dreaded Minotaur. Mm, very rare legends. Yes, very rare creatures. Only spoke of in legends that you may have, uh, may have heard about, and he'll sort of discuss some of them. But um, he'll obviously get into, like, you know, what they are. And the, the main... The, the main thing that... Uh, stands out that he tells you is uh, that they are that essentially from their fell god they are blessed with uh, absurd size and strength and memory so that they may um, so that they may protect the more sacred of the uh, of the Tars uh, uh, you know territories I should say they're, they're known to protect uh, portals into the infernal realm like you know rifts in the in you know in the fabric of reality that may lead to uh, you know the 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 m metastasization of more fell influences from you know the mm -hmm. infernal realm itself. In okay. some at some points they are usually the tars you know they use they they summon devils to help you know lead them. But uh, the minotaurs are not to uh, they're not you know. They're not strangers to also leading these incursions into the, this more civilized lands, I should say. Okay. Hmm. But uh, that so, is all he really knows, unfortunately, about them. I will definitely have to keep an eye out for those. I have not never met one yet. So is it, is it just like the legends that they're they're bull, bull-headed men? Exactly. Literally. Oh, okay. Very good. Bull-headed men, cloven feet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they have three fingers or four. But uh, yes. Okay. Very right. dangerous. Well, um, what, what was... I'm, I'm very sorry. I don't think I've asked you your name, friend. His, his name is... Uh, uh, oh. hmm. Hmm. It's a very interesting question. Very interesting that you would ask that particular <laughs> question at this very moment. <laughs> but he, his, Time to go to the random name generator. <laughs> his, uh, his name is Colin. Colin. The, uh, the arch scribe. Or, or the head oh, scribe, rather. Okay, is that like a like an actual? Is that a title? I guess like uh, do people refer do people refer to him as arch arch scribe, or? Well, it, it's it, I was, it, it's head scribe. It, it's head scribe. Head scribe. Okay. Yeah. He'll sort oh, of like I... go into like a, a brief, you know, just a, a brief tirade about his history, about how um. 
You can you can tell how eager he is to like you know share the knowledge that he knows since it, it only ever seems that the scribes in the building itself really uh, partake in this uh, exchange of information. But uh, he'll essentially tell tell you that uh, when Agatha's Rock was founded, the um, it became a repository for for knowledge and uh, especially philosophy, as the people who were essentially to become the denizens of Nornheim itself, like, uh, essentially used Agatha's Rock as a platform to discuss mankind's role with nature, I should say. Interesting. Since Agatha's Rock is dedicated to the union of plenty, that being the, uh, a small pantheon of two gods, one being believed to have uh, married the other in order to essentially foster, to essentially create the um, the hills, the rivers, and the great forests of the world. And uh, they are believed to... Uh, notice how I'm interrupting it, because it keeps going. Uh, n and it's uh, they are believed to essentially guarantee mankind bounty and... Uh, cooperation with the lands should they you know offer their benedictions to the uh, to the union itself mm. interesting I do I do love hearing about different mythologies and pantheons well well head scribe I do thank you for your time and knowledge and I hope to speak with you again soon he will just let you on your way. He will uh, obviously invite you to come back and return whenever you wish to. Um, if and you also like you know if the in the off chance that you have any knowledge that you wish to discuss or you know mm -hmm. if you wish to. Um, well, another thing that he also does that he does a uh, sort of curio work. So if you find like any, excuse me, if you find any like um, information about like you know ancient history, like, you know, artifacts or, like, you know, just, like, old pottery any, anything, you know what I mean? If you find anything of the sort, he will gladly take it from you and even pay you if you so, uh, if you are more okay. one of those more financially driven folk. Alright, I'll definitely keep that in mind. And, um, we, uh, we have to head out, so I don't have time to do it now, but, uh, in your vast repository, do you have any information on the various places of power that might be found, even if it's just myth or legends, uh, like intersections of ley lines or uh, places of particularly thinness between the, the veils of realms. And he says, uh, well, he'll, that is a very good question, for one thing. A very fine question, indeed. And he'll say, uh, he will talk about uh, the one that you did, you did find he says, like, you know, legend has it that uh, around the lake south of Arendelle there, on occasion, seemingly flashing in and out of reality itself, there is a, uh, the sort of remaining connections to the, uh, the more primal forces of the, uh, of this world, I should say. You know, it, that, that was revealed to have been the, <coughs> the, uh, Sylvian Invocation Stone that you had found, mm. obviously. And the only other one that he knows about, <clears throat> actually, there's two. Well, there's two. There's there's one that he knows for sure might be something similar, and there's another one that's just peculiar. And um, he says, uh, in the in the Toter Mountains, the the parts of them that are nearest us, particularly, I'm gonna like sort of ping it, like shift ping it, so you guys can see it over here. The forest that lays within that sort of valley uh, around those mountains, it is known to... It is sort of well known, beyond reasonable doubt, to be haunted in some way. But those, the people who do venture there notice that uh, the, the sort of uh, the, the fauna there, like, you know, the wolves and the elk and uh, the falcons and etc., they seem oddly cooperative. Like they 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 believe it to be a perhaps some sort of a uh, a ritual site for the older uh, the older faiths. They believe that um, 
they believe that, uh, what was it, um, that, um, the, the people that may have founded the very pantheon of, uh, the Union of Plenty may have come from there, they may have emerged from there. It may be the site, the, you know, the site of the emerging of the very first humans themselves, you know, there's many legends that sort of, uh, move around it, like, you know, that, uh, place being particularly powerful, but, um, some scholars and, uh, priests of the Union of Plenty believe that place to be sacred, so, that is, uh, one thing that he, but, you know, that's a bit of information that he can offer you, which I will mark, I will sort of, uh, mark that with, like, what, uh, let me see. I'm going with a star. Let me see if I can get a star. <coughs> yeah, there we go. I'll mark that with like a little... Whoopsie. Damn it. Damn it. Yeah. Like a little... Yeah, a little North Star right there. Come on. Come on, fat. There we go. So yeah. There you go. Marlo will uh, just take note of that in case they find themselves uh, that area. He's, he's looking for places that might be places of power, uh, just to make sure the, the tars aren't, uh, up to anything nefarious in those areas, but, uh, we have more pressing at the moment. Yes, they, he will also tell you that, um, <clears throat> one thing that is, uh, it's not recent, and, uh, he'll get into sort of, like, the deeper legend behind it. There is... In the forest northeast of Nornheim, there is something that has occurred on a couple of occasions that is uh, noticeable in the the writings that they have, you know, sort of remaining from, like, older, the older history of Northern Geloi. In particular, a... The exact location of it seems to bounce between, like, different locations to the point where nobody is quite sure where it is, but they do know that it is in the northern and eastern section where you happen to be going. <laughs> but um, they, there is a glade there that is shrouded in mist. Some people pass through the areas where it is proclaimed to have been and have seen nothing. Some have passed through that area and, and have seen it, but not quite in the exact area that it was. And some people have even scoured that this entire like area like several times and have not even seen it there is no connection between who has actually searched it uh, you know people who have, who seek out you know treasure hunters have done it you know people who uh, you know adventurers you know wh whether they of of multiple sort of uh, sort of types and uh, levels of prestige but uh it is largely believed to be some sort of a some, some sort of a curse, a, a remnant from uh, Northern Geloi's history as being a uh, being a place where the the members of like you know the, the beings of Fey origin have frolicked, I should say, or have sort of uh, extended their influence. And I mean, there's there's places like this all over, like the you know all, like sort of all over uh, the Great Forest. Which, by the way, this whole, like, th that's sort of the, the way that they designate this whole forest area as the Great Forest. Mm -hmm. There is no end to the areas that you'll find where the, how should I say, the, the wills of the universe seem to intertwine or become stronger. Where you might feel closer to God, like, you know, a particular God, or even farther away, where you feel a slight, uh, a slight calm, or even a slight closeness to the very, so, so, to the primal sort of, uh, substantive parts of one's own being. It is, uh, well known amongst people who do live here that the forests have hidden power. But uh, to the, to most people, to most you know of the human settlements in Northern Geloi, they believe that they may com uh, commune with that power by praying, mostly to the Union of Plenty. It is a very prominent uh, pantheon amongst the people here. But uh, that is all he has to say. Uh, he can he can you know give you tons of stories. You know most of them like our childhood. You know or stories for children. 
that uh, involve the forest, you know, the great forest, and their relation to the people who do live here. But uh, he'll also flat out tell you that most people don't really leave the settlements, you know. The huntsmen, you know, there is a guild in Nornheim, uh, the, which I believe is called, yeah, I do have the name for it. The House of the Bowersman. The House of the Bowersman, even, I mean, as well-traveled mm -hmm. as they are, there are parts of the forest that they simply have just not fully scoured, or they believe to have, but keep finding new things every day. He'll then say, to, to close it off, because I know I've been going on for a little bit, he'll say, uh, well and truly, he feels that uh, the forests are truly mysterious and may be alive in more ways than one. It's in a, way, a big way, it's a miracle that uh, they've even been able to survive truly out here, because in a lot of ways it seems that the forest is against them, but uh, they can attribute that to the influence of the Union of Plenty, for sure. Their ability to survive. So I hope that answers your uh, questions, Marlo. Uh, yeah, Marlo will will thank him for his time and the information. Uh, then look to Connor and see if he's ready to uh, head out. Yep, I'm good to go. There was uh, there was one more place I wanted to go to before. Uh... Before we turn in for night, if that's all right with you, bud. Uh, sure. All right, because this, as I hold up the jug of Tor milk, is driving me nuts. Yeah. Guys, last minutes of life, and he goes for milk? I don't think so. So I got definitely wanted to look for some kind of potions or chemist person. Maybe he just wanted some big mommy milkies, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, but I mean, like, his la last legs in life. I don't know. Mike, I'm thinking, Connor's probably thinking it's maybe something uh, that heals or maybe something that would give him, like, extra strength. But he, th he, he definitely thinks it's worth looking into. Sure. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Let me actually read what this does. Hold on. Uh, okay. Just want to, because I know I know there is a there is a name for it. I just want to make sure that like what it did exactly. All right. So the potion seller in northern, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in Nornheim. Is confined to a well. It's it's in a it's in a sort of like a plaza area, like a uh, Nornheim is far too fancy and sophisticated for simple market plazas. The plaza in question is a. Uh, it's essentially a a statue. Like there's, a, it, there's a statue in the center depicting what you can only assume to be some sort of a. Uh, What's well, it? It's a depiction of the Union of Plenty. There's a a man draped in uh, hides. And uh, with a, with a sort of uh, a, a freshly slain elk on his back, and there is a woman with a bread basket full of, uh, well, just a just a cornucopia full of like you know, the bounties of the earth. And all around that are a series of shops, you know, like actual shop buildings with windows. There are some stands, but the stand, the concept of uh, presenting your wares in a stand outside is for the lesser folk. Understandably, of course. The potion seller of Nornheim, the uh, a store that is known as uh, uh, I know what it's called. Trust me, I, I I definitely am not just pulling it out of my ass. I swear to God. As uh, it's called uh, f uh. It's called the uh, Merelda's Mystis uh, Mystifying Concoctions. There we go. And uh, okay. it is is quite is quite a new building. Quite a. Not to I'd say not to, definitely doesn't have the some of the wear and tear of some of the older shops here. Like you can definitely tell which shops have been built first, and which have been built later. But uh, 
to greet you is who you can only assume to be the same person at, on the title of the store itself. A woman in loose dress who has dangling from a sort of like a... Basically like a... Just what, what they are is they look to be ingredients that are on hooks. And they're just like sort of hooked to like the... The sort of thicker parts of like this sort of like a gown that she's wearing. And she also has pockets in the gown that you can see are full of vials and whatnot, pouches. And, uh, you know, she's just a, a fairly pale woman. Very, very, a, like a full head of like a red hair. And every now and again, like it's a weird tick that she does. So you can only assume that it is a tick. Like while she's speaking, she'll just like sniff and like rub her nose really loud. Like, like, ugh. Quite disgusting, but she is doing her best, like all of us. That's all we can ask of her. <laughs> exactly. So, she will welcome you in and say, uh, Ah, what can I do for it? <clears throat> well, greetings. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you decipher the ingredients and the purpose of contents in this pouch. I hand her the, the water skin of which I have the milk in. Um, me and my friends, it... we... Had... I'm sorry, I was going to say, didn't you put it in, like, the, the bottle, like, the, the health potion bottle? Yeah. I did, yes, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, so the, uh, the health potion bottle that I, that I used. Let's say, so me and my friend were in a fight with a, uh, with a Gortor, I believe, and in his last moments of life, he went for this potion. I'm assuming it's, if it's just regular milk, that would have been just very anticlimactic. <laughs> I like how you're pressuring me. Like, this better be that guy. I, I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to. <laughs> <laughs> like, listen. I mean, if it, you... if, it, if it is just milk, it's all right, bud. <laughs> I've, I've been starving you guys for too long. You guys each are getting a cloak of protection. Uh, <laughs> a staff of power. <laughs> Fuck this hold. You know, you, you guys, by then, should, by the time you get there, you'll be level 16. <laughs> Nah, anyway. She's going to... She's going to take the bottle from you. She's going to, like, you know, sort of, like, uh, look at it, jostle it about, just, like, you know, give it a, give it a sniff. It is, again, I had told you when you had went to smell it, it smells of milk. Which, I mean, I don't know if you've smelt warm milk before, like, or milk that's just a little aged. Yeah. But... It's not sour, it's just turning into cheese, you know. It's Eventually it'll just turn into cheese. Which, I mean, you know, it, milk has to sour pretty kind of in order to turn into cheese, but you get the idea. Yeah. Seems edible enough. <clears throat> but, uh, cheese of course. <laughs> uh, imagine. But anyway... She's working on it. She's like, ah, oh, let me see. And she starts sniffing it. She sniffs it very hard. You can only assume that her sense of smell might be slightly stunted. Because she's <laughs> trying her absolute damnness. She's like shoving it, shoving that shit really up her nose. <laughs> and she says, uh, ah, might need to do a little bit more testing. Uh, wait here. And she's going to retreat to her, to the private parts of her, whoa, to the, to the, you know, her, her uh, to the back rooms, I should say, Jesus. Hmm. And, uh, give me one second, hold on. Uh, all right. So retreat to the back rooms of her little shop. And, uh, you'll just hear the sounds of, like, you know, glass being shuffled around, uh, the sounds of, you know, mortar, the mortar hitting pestle, you know, mixing, sort of like, you know, spoons uh, banging around the sides of bowls and stuff like that. You know, classic alchemist, uh, you know, noises, alchemy mm -hmm. noises. Mm-hmm. While, uh, while she's making her alchemy noises... Are there, like, potions on display in the shop? Or does she, like, sell soap? <laughs> deal? No, I mean, she, she sells a lot of things. Uh, her main uh, speciality, she'll say, like, you know, is sort of written on... Uh, or sort of like a 
I guess, etched on a wooden slab that she holds over the counter. Like, it was hanging over the counter by a series of ropes. It'll say, uh, medicines, uh, boons, and, uh, it'll say medicines, boons, and stuff for your nether, uh, well, bits for your, uh, what's the word? God damn it, I have it in my head, uh, concoctions for your nether regions, that were, uh, that's, yeah, that were, concoctions for your <laughs> nether regions. And, uh, She'll return with the bottle in tow. It's only like she's only like used it a quarter of the substance, and she says, um, "Good news and bad news. Bad mm -hmm. news is it's too old to make something potent. Good news is I can synthesize it into." And she sort of thinks to herself, uh, Somewhat effective boon to your strength if you need to be stronger. Hmm. I think it would be useful. Uh, what, what would you charge for a service like that? It's just, um. Uh, she'll. She'll, uh, do, you know, just like, uh, put her hand on her, uh, on her chin and sort of, like, rest. You know, re you know start resting on the, the counter that she sits at and think to herself for a bit and say, uh, actually, I don't know why I don't have the PNG open. Uh, where is that thing? S sane magical prices. Useful as always. <laughs> Again, there's always something I don't open, like that I mean to open for when I, when we play this game. Oh, but I actually didn't really answer your question, did I, Marley? Yeah, there's, on, on display there are, like, mainly what's on display are, like, uh, like incense, uh, you know, like uh, herbs, like er like pastes, sort of salves, sort of stuff like that. Um, there are a couple of potions, but not many. And uh, I mean, you know, you can only assume that she has. She may may have more, pr you know, products in the back, like or rather in like you know her 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 deeper stock. But uh, it mainly just seems to be just like stuff for you know, health stuff to improve your, your humors, as it were. But yeah, let's see. Same medical purpose. How much is a potion of strength? Let's see. Because it's not... Uh... uh common items. Uh, where is consumables? Alright, fine. So I'm just gonna have to look at what's... Give me a second, I am sorry. No worries, man. Okay, interesting. It is not here. Um, I'm going to say that... It would be to synthesize it because all the ingredients are basically already there in what you gave her. She'll do it for. She'll do it for 60 gold. Hmm. Carver has to think about that for minutes before saying. Money's not that important. So, yeah, I would, I would, I would agree to that. Okay. She'll be back in a jiffy. Again, all, all of what you need is there, so it's not going to be too difficult. The only unfortunate thing is that it won't be as powerful, but... Let me see what it does again. Mm. Ooh, quite cool. I'd like tomorrow say, say, so apparently Gortor Titty makes you stronger. <laughs> uh, yes. Might even say that it makes your strength legendary. Ah, uh. <laughs> uh, because because dairy because the dairy is, is milk. That was that was pretty great. Thank you for that. You know, I actually didn't get it at first. <laughs> Before he explained it, I was like, "What? Oh. I don't get it." <laughs> That's one of your butter jokes. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're we're grasping for straws now. Yeah. 
but she'll return with uh, with the concoction in a new bottle. It says bottles free of charge here, and uh, thank you. She'll hand it to you, and uh, for an hour upon supping from this uh, concoction, your strength score will increase to nineteen. Alrighty. And th would, uh, would this be the same as a health potion if I wanted to take it? Would it be a bonus action or a full action? Uh, it's a bonus action. Same thing as a bonus okay. action. Alrighty. Materials? Well, thank you very much for your services. And she's just gonna sniffle, like, you know, really loudly and uh, just return, like, you know, return to her studies. Or just, you know, return to what, whatever she was doing before. Alchemy things, you know. <laughs> all right. I'll turn to Mario and say, uh, all right, that's that's all I wanted to do for today. Or is there anything else you want to, anywhere you want to go? Uh, no. I think we, we turn in, and I'm eager to get a early start tomorrow. Me as well. Fantastic. Uh, upon returning to the Crock and Miller to retire for the day, you guys see a familiar face. It is the Watchman. Here, as he had promised he was, he, s he sees you guys in the tavern, and he... I mean, you can tell that he's trying to uh, maintain some level of anonymity, so he doesn't approach you. He just nods to you and you know, tips his hat and, and uh, acknowledges that he has seen you, but he returns to just uh, slowly drinking the drink that he has while the rest of the tavern continues on with their uh, bits of merriment. You don't see the Keepers of the Hammer. They have not returned yet, unfortunately. Oh, don't like the sign of that, but definitely have faith. I hope, anyways. A, a man that does approach you, though, is good old Clayton, Clayton Vernace, the member of the Short oh. Shots. Who consider you guys one of his best buds? Oh. I have changed his voice slightly, so now he doesn't sound like. So he maybe he matches more the the picture I use for him, like a little better. He's gonna say, uh, <clears throat> "Excuse me, I have unfortunately run out of water." He's gonna say, "Greetings, men. I uh, hope." You bring good tidings. Oh, it's good to see you again, Clayton. Yes, um, I would say so. You know, you always seem to brighten up the room whenever you walk in. Don't mean to brag. <laughs> he says, very much so indeed, I agree. Now I've seen to it that my brother has everything he needs. And, well, now I have nothing but time, Much luckily. So now I can rest. Working with the Shore Shots has its perks, of course, but it's good to finally just relax. Though I don't know how much longer I can be relaxing here. It seems that things are heating up. Mm. Yes, were you aware? Did you, were you, uh, did you see the mob earlier? Yes, angry mob. I've seen many angry mobs in my time, of course. None of them have, how should I say, none of them have brought better signs of things to come, I should say. Or they have not ever led to positive outcomes in the future. But, uh, you will, of course, you know, Small talk, all that. You know, he's talking about how he's uh, getting very well acclimated to his uh, new and very much better life here, where his skills can be appreciated by men who are willing to, you know, actually use them. Mm -hmm. As opposed to being impressed and being turned into a brigand, which was not to his liking. <clears throat> He shall also say, well, he'll, he'll ask you uh, what you guys are essentially up to. Well, can't give away too much, but we are 
assisting in the, uh, the tour problem going around the city. Talks with some, uh, with some guards about some hidden presence, as it were. He says, I've, I have heard about the, the kidnappings. Scary stuff, scary stuff, indeed. Mm. Um, it's very unfortunate, people being spirited away into the night. I, we keep saying that. All right, at least I keep saying that. <laughs> it's not it's like a, a common... It's a good movie. Yeah, yeah, it is, and it's not like a common phrase or anything, but it's like, it, it is true, you are being, like, taken into the night, and fucking, you know, being taken to God knows where, so you are being spirited away, but y you know what I mean. It's It's just a... It's weird that we keep on using that term. But anyway. It sounds old-timey. It works. Yeah, sure. He says, uh... Hey, um, if... <clears throat> you know... I trust you all, of course. I hope you trust me. If and you were in need of a scout... I do pride myself on my, on my work. I would be more than willing to venture out with you all again. Thank you very much for the offer, Clayton. We'll definitely keep you in mind. Of course. And he is going to, uh... Man, I could go for some alcohol myself. He's gonna proceed to order himself some, uh, elderberry ale. Mmm. Your father smells of elderberries. <laughs> so. Now look tomorrow and say, uh... Honestly, I don't know. Do you th I think, uh, personally, I think we should take this mission tomorrow alone, considering the, what's his name, the Count asked us personally, I think it'd be kind of, I don't know, would you think overstepping our boundaries if we were to ask anyone else <clears throat> to help us? I think he's more so concerned with the successful execution of the mission, and... He, uh, Clayton has proven himself before. Uh, besides, I believe the, he wanted us to stop by and discuss with him before we parted. You're right. Could you're always right. clarify. Okay. Yes. Well, I mean, I'm fine. I'm fine either way, either way, but, uh. There is also, of course, right. the, uh, Sorry, I was gonna say this is also, of course, the Watchman, who is, uh, mm -hmm. who is also. I mean, he. You haven't. I mean, I'm assuming you guys. I mean, I'll. I'll wait until you exactly tell me. But he is around. You guys haven't like checked in with him yet, but he is around, and he is. He has been. Pro he's proved willing to assist you in the past, so you know. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's just a question of, who might be better suited for the job is. The Watchman, he seems like a very sneaky man, but I don't, I'm don't. i not sure if he... Uh, well, no, that's kind of kind of a lie. He probably would be kind of an outdoorsman type, wouldn't he? Well, um, I did... If you do actually check the... Uh, the, oh, the, the note, all the important characters? Yeah, I did actually class the potential... Like, the companions that you can take. And oh, okay. uh, just, so, just so you know, like... If in this in the, in these sort of situations where you have like a selection between the people that you can ask to accompany you on your on these missions, you'll know what they're good at. And uh, he isn't like there is actually like a, a class. Like I, basically, what I did was I put like the, hold on, I, I'll actually just bring it up so people can see what I'm talking about. Uh, on the important characters, those are the guys. On the companions, if you look there, there it, I did like sort of class them by like three of their main sort of uh, you know. The, the main features that sort of single them out from, I guess, the other uh, companions specifically. And uh, I do have the Watchman there and Clayton. So um, mm -hmm. that, that'll that sort of help you in the future. Or even right now, like if you uh, do want to uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Sort of, jeez, uh, yeah, you know, you know just, just, just pick from which one you think would be the most useful. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I think Connor would say, like, personally, if we were to take along a companion, maybe uh, Clayton's outdoorsman training and tra and scouting abilities might come a bit, bit more in handy. 
I agree. The Watchmen is, well, more of a yes. more of a hunter, and certainly more more. Uh, if we were just hunting cars or searching them out in the city, I would yes. definitely seek his help. But uh, we're going to be looking for something out there, uh, a a place, not necessarily a creature. So. Yes, we got idea. We need a something like that. Probably need a scout, not a hunter. Right, you're right about that. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Just in terms of, and I did mention, by the way, that um, the area, like that, that area, like um, uh, like if I could just mark it, like I'll, I'll show you, like just this, this area, like, whoa, oh, this area, like right here. This is, this is all difficult terrain. Like it's all just fucking thick as hell forest. Mm -hmm. With barely any breaks in it, so you know, my it's definitely like if if you have someone that doesn't have the natural explorer perk, it will just be difficult to rain throughout, which will definitely extend the trip. Yeah. Um, Clayton has natural explorer because he is a scout fighter, and you get that when you're a scout fighter, which I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, traveling with him won't slow your pace, which is what difficult terrain normally would do. Yeah, Scout Fighter is like a better ranger. Uh, yeah, well, it's it's a, just a kind of ranger that you might not get if you yeah. get a ranger. Like, if you, if you want a ranger, but you don't, if you, you want to play, like, Aragon and not, like, fucking, you know, not, mm. like, a ranger that can cast spells if you want to, like, get rid of that, like, sort of flair, because I thought that was always kind of, like, not that it sucked, but it was like like flavor wise. I thought it was always kind of limiting, because like when you want to just be like that rough and gruff, like you know, fucking, I'm I am a scout. You know? Like I, yeah. I, I travel the woodlands and I fucking you know eat rocks and and you know fuck, <laughs> fuck elk or whatever or something like stupid, something stupid like that. But then you know the the, the scout fighter it does make a little bit more sense if you want to be like really rugged and like you know sort of dangerous or whatever. I gotcha. And I played a ranger fighter before. It was a good time. Yeah, exactly. But anyway. If you guys wish to retire, um, you may. Well, I guess we probably would talk to, talk to Clayton before we before he bed down saying, Well, hey, we would uh, really appreciate your help going out and uh helping count whatever is I'm I keep I'm bad with names, I keep forgetting his I think I also put him in the important characters. Yep, Totenmeyer. Totenmeyer. Count Totenmeyer. Yep, there we go. So, uh, we would be... We would, would be willing to... Well, personally, I'd be willing to pay. I just don't have a whole lot of gold at the moment. So I would definitely... I would give what I have. No, he said... He basically says, uh... No, no, that's fine. I mean, would be nice to have a cut if we find any loot. But you don't have to pay me. I owe you guys well my life in a lot of ways. So, you know, he, he assures you that he, he is willing to travel with you on the on the merits that you are good company. Hmm. We try. All right, so, <clears throat> uh, time skip, or is there anything else before you have, you retire? No, I'm good. What about you, Marla? Um, no, I think I think that uh, everything we need to take care of, we've got a complete situated and yeah no I think we're good fantastic all right so the new morning arrives um you look outside and well it's uh, I mean it, it's it's getting quite cold it's getting quite chilly you you, you can tell by by the way the uh, you know the like you know the trees look that very soon it will be winter
Wait, hold on. Let me think for a second. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, no. I miscounted the days. No, it's 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 very much within the <laughs> in the middle of fall. So, I mean, you know, middle of fall, winter's coming. Yeah, you know, it's you could definitely tell that it's fall, which was obvious before. You know what? Forget I even said anyway. <laughs> I I just I like to be reminded that it's fall because fall is the best season. Well, it, you're right in a lot of ways. You're definitely right in a lot of ways. Fall is quite nice. Very the leaves have the highest crunch potential. <laughs> yeah. mm. Satisfying, Prince. I, I do agree with you. <laughs> You're still laughing in the background. Uh -huh. I mean, She's it, working on art right across from me, so she can only hear my... Uh... <laughs> she didn't like my dairy pun earlier, but... <laughs> I mean, I thought, I mean, when I got it, I thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that reminds me. Let me tell you something, because I, I also do my podcast, sponsored. Well, I, I don't have any money. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the, the one, Jesus, I don't even, I mean, it, it, I can, I can say this. It, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't really care. I don't care if I get the fucking stream taken down. It's nothing, it's nothing bad. But, um, the, well, it's, it's kind of bad. But, uh, okay, so we, on my show... I'll I'll tell the story then we'll continue. Uh, on my show we did a we did an episode called we call we called it the Chimp Zone, and it it was based off of a it's based off of a Facebook group called the same name where they basically post monkey memes like or chimp memes, and um, it was literally just an episode about monkeys or chimps or whatever. It's, it's we we're we're totally running out of ideas so we just fucking do whatever the hell we want. We did a whole episode just talking about nothing but monkeys, and um. Okay, I found this, I found this, um, uh, I found this, uh, definition on Urban Dictionary for, a, for a, a phrase called monkey food, and the definition was, it, it, the, the definition was, um, fried chicken, rice, and peas, and, it, it, yeah, yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm thinking, like, oh, like, I'm imagining a monkey with a fucking, you know, like, a, a plate full of, like, fried chicken, rice, and peas, and so I'm talking about it on the air, and my engineer's like, Austin, that's racist! And I'm just like, is it? <laughs> oh, I guess it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh my god. He's like fucking pulling his hair out. And I was when, like, the, when the racism is, racism is so casual, you don't even quite get it until yeah. someone points it out, and you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's... Wait. That's some potent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, once I heard fried chicken, then I was like, "Ooh, that's 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 some spicy uh, wordplay, definitely." Oh, and, but it, w it was what was so funny was that like I really was like, "Oh, I guess it kind of is, right?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, "No, you're yep, you're right. I, I'm seeing it now. <laughs> Urban Dictionary has led me astray." <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was I, I was look, I was going into it so innocently. I was like, oh, like a little monkey with a plate of food. It's like, oh no. <laughs> Whoops. All right. So I I'm going to waste no time. You guys return to the count. He he expresses a lot of gratitude, saying, "Thank you so much. Thank you. You men are very brave." And he calls for uh, he he calls for what you can only assume to be his uh, his court mage, and he says, "Tigus, is there anything that we can offer these men for their deeds? Perhaps that will help them on their adventure." And uh, a man, a very interesting looking man, perhaps someone who you have never well, he's obviously you've never seen them before, but uh, someone who is. The, the most alien-looking man that you might have seen maybe in your life, maybe in a very long time, I will describe him. His, aside from his clothes, which are themed properly to his overall aesthetic, I will explain, his hair looks to be made of fire, as does his, uh, as does the, sort of, uh, the pupils in his eyes. His eyes seem to swirl with a sort of like a vortex of flame everywhere he steps. Like it, it seems to leave like a, a sort of like a scor an almost sort of scorched mark which goes away in time. But uh, Marlo, you are you're assaulted with just the essence of pure magic as he presents himself to you all. 
he is... I mean, you can tell that... Uh, actually, I mean, eh, let me think. Would you have seen one before? Uh... I am staying in the consistent theme that this is a fairly low fantasy setting, so how about you guys roll me a... Uh... Marlo, I'll let you roll an arcana check, but if you if history is higher, you can roll history. Wait, say both of us roll or just Marlo? Uh, you, both of you can roll, but for you, uh, Connor, you'd roll history. Uh, history? Okay. Yes. Okay. Nope. Wait, hold on. You actually rolled a 9, so you rolled a 11. Because your, your sheet is set oh. to disadvantage for some reason. Oh, I did, did I? Weird. But, anyway. <clears throat> excuse me. Damn, you know what? I should I should fucking get myself some snacks when when I do this. Some like checks mix or whatever. I actually would hit the spot right now. But anyway, this guy is an Asimar. But uh I mean Oh well, he he is an Asimar. You can definitely uh feel the Well he, he, he the essence that he gives off, it is magical in nature, which denotes that he is a practitioner of magic, which you could have guessed by the way that he uh presented himself, but he is a, like, there is a divine sort of aspect about him as well. If I were to describe it in a very short phrase, he, within him is a raging tempest of fire that never dies out. He introduces himself as Tigus Faragon, and he says, uh, yes, I certainly believe that I can find something on it, let me see. And uh, he reaches into a bag of holding that he has, and he presents a, uh, essentially like a leather strip with uh, three what appear to be burning feathers on them. And he says, ah, oh, here we are, a gift from the Mother Phoenix. Yeah. And he gives it to you, Connor. Um, so these, these feathers are actually on fire? Um, they look to be on fire, but if you were to touch them, they are... I mean, they're they're slightly warm, but they're not dangerous in any way. Oh, okay. Like, he, yeah, he reaches his hands out, like, nervously, but feeling that they're not nearly as hot as he expecting it to, he just, like, kind of... He, he physically, uh, or vi visibly, kind of relaxes a good bit. All right, good. So, <clears throat> this Tigus has granted you the Phoenix Charm. It is a necklace of carved amber stones, I guess I forgot to mention that, and three <laughs> phoenix feathers dangling from a long strip of leather. Alright, so, as an action, you can crush and absorb the power within a single feather to cause one of three effects. Alright, so, and I will uh, copy and paste this into the chat and also talk to them. Uh, we'll talk about them. So... Your attacks are imbued with the power of flames. Any attack you land deals an extra d4 of fire damage. This benefit lasts for one minute. You gain 2d6 plus 2 HP, or you gain a resistance... Uh, uh, Jesus, you gain resistance, resistance to fire and frost damage for 10 minutes. Hmm. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the feathers do not... Uh, like, you know, they don't... They don't regenerate after a long rest or anything. He uh, he explains that uh, these feathers were plucked from the Mother Phoenix herself. Her blessing imbued with each one, within each one. Use it wisely. Thank thank you thank you very much for this gift. You are welcome, and. I mean, I should say that uh, Count Totenmeyer is quite visibly excited as, uh, you know, this exchange is going on. He, uh, he says, uh, he says, um, let me think, uh, he says, uh, let me be careful with my words here. Also, the sounds of a tavern are still going. Let me turn that off. He says, uh, truly this meat... He said, <clears> that, that's my regular voice, Jesus. He says, <laughs> truly this meeting 
was ordained by the gods themselves. Why else would we be blessed in our hour of need with a man who can slay Tars? And effectively. And, uh... It's, uh, it's almost like destiny. Exactly. He says, uh... Your foray into the forest will surely be dangerous. I have one last thing to offer you, should you need it. I have said that it is all hands on deck here, but... Being that I am quite eager to know of the origins and the potential benefit that this foray may be to Nornheim, I'm willing to offer you an escort, as it were, or a, a man who may assist you on your journey. Oh, excuse me, fucking burping, goddammit, I'm, I'm an ogre. Uh. <coughs> <coughs> uh. But, uh, he presents a man who is garbed in full plate, lacquered full plate, some of the, uh, his pauldrons and some, uh, it, like, uh, some, uh, parts of his, uh, breastplate are inlaid with designs of, like, a tree. Where his helmet, uh, doesn't, uh, well, the, the, you know, whereas most knights would have plumage coming out of their helms, he has, uh, what appears to be a, uh, like, a bit of, like, a, a, just like, just like a vine, like, you know, a bit of, like, sort of, a you know, you know, like, it's not like poison ivy, but, you know, like, the, the creep, like the creeper vines that sort of like like grow on yeah. trees and stuff like that. He has that sort of coming out of the top of his uh, helm. And uh, with uh, uh, clasped in his gauntleted fists is a what appears to be some sort of a ceremonial. Uh, what is it called? A uh, halberd. There we go. He introduces himself as Sir. Sir Galen Maddock. Galen Maddock, all right. And it is quite easy to tell, based on the way that he is dressed, that he is a paladin. Mm. He... Look him up and down. Give him a nice nod. Very nice. He sort of stands at attention next to the Count, and the Count says, uh, Sir Galen is a dedicated member of the of the Order of the Emerald Knights. Protectors of the forest, I have charged them with clearing out the Tars wherever they find them. Unfortunately, I do not have as many as I had hoped I would have. The Emerald Knights are... They are a disciplined order. They are rare. I dare not use them, or I dare not waste their skills or send them into situations that would be less fortuitous for them. But I believe this to be a fortuitous matter, and so I'm willing to grant you one of their champions. If in you need him. Well, personally, I can't, can't see the reason to turn down such esteemed help this would, only, this would only better our chances. Uh, alright. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh. So would this be, uh, like, uh, Clayton yeah. and this guy? Um. Sorry, hold on, I'm thinking. The encounters are balanced. Uh, <laughs> I guess it doesn't really make sense why you wouldn't just take all five of them. <laughs> or rather, all three of them. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Even though the encounters are... The encounters, I do balance around three people. But, uh... So, I... For, like, purely um, gameplay reasons, I'm gonna have to cuck you and say that, uh... You know, you can only pick one. But, you know... Mm. I'm sure you'll forgive me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean it's it, it's um it's it's mainly so uh 
It's be- it's mainly because uh, the of the unique sort of uh, boons that they give to the party. Like each of them has a unique one, and so like it's it's so they don't like fucking overlap and stack like crazy. You know, I I know I know like it's I guess in, on the face of it it seems like I'm just like not doing it literally just because I don't want to, but it's. Oh yeah, no, I got it. Yeah, it's 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 just a gameplay thing, really. No problem. I, I do that. Too. Yeah, no, it, it's it, look it, at look at all these cool people you can hire as mercenaries. They're like, well, we have a lot of money, and I'm like, you may choose one. They all hate <laughs> each other. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like, look at uh, if I were, if I were to if you were to say that you were already taking a companion or like, you have one. Then, uh, I mean, at that point, Totenmeyer would just say, like, oh, well, in that case, I kind of need him here, too. So, you know, if you have somebody, then you might as well stay here. And the watch ma- uh, the watchman generally doesn't like being around too many people, so. There's your answer. There's my half ass justification. Mm-hmm. But I will show you um, Sir Galen's unique... Uh, I'll, I'll explain his sort of unique boon that he grants to the party. By I will click it right here. But uh, in short, if you don't feel like reading, the key m- part of it, the the main aspect that's really important, is that uh, Sir Galen he never f- like runs from a f- or rather he never runs from a fight and he doesn't commit to an ambush. He is honor bound to face his enemies and uh, in like you know. Almost like you know, sort of a uh, pitched combat, I should say. He doesn't. Uh, he he wouldn't besmirch his honor by hiding or uh, setting up some sort of an ambush. He confronts the evils of the forest with gusto. And uh, <clears throat> this sort of uh, willingness, this uh, impetus to do good in the world, it sort of extends to the rest of you. And essentially, when you start an encounter with him in the party. As soon as that encounter starts, like when it officially starts, you know, you're in combat, you gain temporary hit points equal to half his level plus his charisma modifier. Now, this doesn't stack, so like the uh, the invocation of Uraneth, I believe it's, what is it, it's four, right? No, it's, it's how much how much temporary XP, uh, XP do you get? Um, it's uh, five. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So, like, it doesn't stack, so, like, if you get, like, a source of temporary hit points from something that's more powerful, the one that's more powerful will just overtake it. But, the interesting, I guess the sort of thing that makes this a little bit more interesting is that if the encounters start in natural forests, half of that value is converted into temporary health. Uh, nac- well, it's, it, it, it increases your max health value. Mm-hmm. So in this case, what is he's level three, half of that, and you would get three temporary health. So you would get, uh, if you start the encounter in a forest, your maximum hit points increases by two, and you gain one temporary health. Okay. Hmm. Connor will turn tomorrow and say, uh, it might be better, uh, not to speak ill of Clayton, but it might be better to have someone who's a bit more experienced in the forest as the, uh, acting as our guide, you know what I mean? Uh, I will say he's not a... Uh, well, I'll, I'll say like what he is exactly. He's a, he's an Oath of the Ancients paladin, but he has no... Um, well, while he can uh, speak with animals, that's one of the spells that he can use, he's not like uh, an explorer. He's not like a... He doesn't have natural explorer. So in the times that you don't really know where to go or... Essentially, well, yeah, like he, he's just not a natural explorer. So it, the sort of... Uh, the, ben- the the penalty of the the um you know the uh, sorry the difficult terrain will still kick in. Oh, I see. So, uh, can you explain to me again what a uh, natural explorer does? Is it just removes the difficult terrain, or does it mean like we also can't get lost while we're there? Or? I will click it. Uh, hold on, I have his sheet open. There we go. <clears throat> So, you ignore difficult terrain, you have advantage, well, he has advantage on initiative rolls, uh, that's, that's another combat thing, uh, yeah, you can read it, difficult terrain doesn't slow your group's mm-hmm. travel, your group can't become lost except by magical means, you know, you can forage, well, I mean, when you forage, you find twice as much food as you normally would, etc. Oh, I see, okay. 
Okay, now I know. No, it's half the battle. Exactly. So, yeah. you, you know, you have... Yo, I'm finding ants fucking everywhere. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Free protein, man. <laughs> exactly. I should turn them into a soup. Mm -hmm. Probably well, wouldn't chocolate even... ants are apparently very popular. Chocolate what? Chocolate covered ants. I mean, yeah, I, I dig it. I mean, you, you can probably put it in your rice. Like if you're making oh, rice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. Added protein. Extra bit of crunch. Exactly. But, uh... <clears throat> You basically got three selections, you know, the... We all know what paladins do, obviously. <laughs> yeah. He is an Oath of the Ancients paladin, so he'll have that sort of, uh... I don't know, I don't think he has any... Like, he's level three, so he literally just took his oath, so he doesn't have anything, like, particularly crazy. Uh, where is he? There we go. You know, he has the ability to heal, the smite, etc., uh, he has the channel divinity, nature's wrath. So you know he's he's got a, like a, a lot of uh, stuff about him, and uh, he's he is a polearm master. So he's like you know he, he, the the mainstay like the main weapon of his order is the halberd because it's a very defensive uh, weapon, and they are charged with defending the forest. So he is like his fighting style is oriented around the use of that as a polearm. Uh, Clayton is obviously highly ranged focused. He does have the crossbow master. No, he has the what is it called? I think it is called crossbow master feet. Yeah, yeah it's crossbow expert. Obviously, he's got the superiority, like you know, the combat superiorities with the uh, that come with the scout fighter. And uh, the watchman has the assassinate the stealth. And also, you gotta remember, he doesn't sleep. Like, so he never needs to mm -hmm. sleep. So that, I mean, that essentially, unless he just, like, gets a one on his uh, perception roll, which he literally, like, if I were to use just his passive perception, he it's so unlikely that he would miss it, because his passive, I believe, is, let me see, yeah, his passive perception is 20, so, you know, he's very, like, he he, he is the, the watchman, if I should, uh, if I can sum up his whole bit in one word. So, yeah. Pick from what you wish, if you so wish to pick. I mean, all it will mean is that uh, the XP is divvied up amongst everybody instead of just you two. Okay. Alright, uh, Mardo, any, uh, what, what's your thoughts? If we are bringing a companion with us, I favor uh, Clayton, because we've worked with him in the past, and... Uh, no, no offense to you, but um, those with lofty ideals and, and heavy armor are, are generally not uh, mm. too Stealthiest. open to my, my particular style of engaging in combat. You, you being the exception, of course. I try. Well, man, I hate to say it, but I agree with you, actually. Uh, might be. I think it is better to have like a a scout helping us, helping us directly in in overcoming the difficult terrain, as opposed to you know another another heavy hitter. Not not to speak ill of Sir Gaelic here. <clears throat> he uh, he scowls at you and spits at your feet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> he literally chops your head off. <laughs> Imagine. No, he does not do that. But <clears throat> bonus action to hit you with the back of the spear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's so weird. Like uh, in every like melee fighting game that has a spear in it, like they always use it as like a slashing weapon as well, and I find that so interesting. With the uh, because it looks cool when you like spin, big arc, yeah. and <laughs> even if it's like not really effective, if you should you should just be like shanking people with it but yeah it's mainly a stabbing implement i thought but you know what do i know i'm just a i'm just a guy at a computer i guess it's all about all about them sweeps <laughs> exactly <laughs> and, the, and the sweeps do like fucking max damage as if you were stabbing i'm just like wait hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. why don't we just like fucking smack them with it at that point you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah just hold it and spin really fast bull yard rules <laughs> exactly 
But uh, Clayton is quite eager. It's uh, He's been basically just sitting on his ass getting drunk for the past uh, couple of days. And, well, I mean, that's productive if you're into that sort of thing. But he much, would much rather test out his brand spanking new heavy crossbow that he bought. Yes, boy. So he's quite happy about this. All right, before we close, because I would like to give Connor some rest. Connor, uh, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Work in the morning. Of course. Yeah. Both of you guys are on, like, the East, and East uh, time zone or Atlantic yes. time zone? Yes, we are. E well, I'm, I'm EST. I'm pretty sure Scott is EST, too. Yep. Oh, okay. okay, yeah, that's like a two and a half, hour and a half, two hour and a half difference. No worries. The, uh... I will explain how this is going to work at the, uh, well, before we head off, like I said. <clears throat> so, what you guys are about to embark on, while it is a small one, there will be larger ones as we continue exploring the world, is an expedition. And expeditions... Excuse me. Jesus Christ, I am... My gastrointestinal system betrays me. <laughs> Expeditions are, uh, how should I say? It's usually when you go off the beaten path, obviously. Like, uh, like, things like carrying capacity and stuff like that, haven't, they haven't really been important things in this, uh, campaign. But, uh, the only, the, I sort of save them for times like these when you guys are traveling fairly, like, far into, like, sort of dangerous areas. But, like, you know, where, where it might take, like, a couple of days for you to return. Stuff like that. The uh, the only thing that's really different is stuff like travel pace and like difficult terrain become more important, and uh, that's really it. I was thinking uh, it's not like again the carrying capacity is kind of annoying to have to like keep up with because they like when you are heavily encumbered it does affect your speed etc. But I'm gonna just sort of leave that out. The only other thing is that uh, there is just, like, a heavier... Like, the, the encounters that you will find are rolled as opposed to being usually, like, pitched like I usually have them. So there is, an, uh, there is a chance that you will run into an encounter that is fairly difficult, I should say, and some that are just brain-dead easy. But um, it's just meant to sort of uh, flush out the fact that, you know, oh, your guys are going into dangerous territory. It's... Uh, this is the, this is the part too, like you know. This is you know the part where you're supposed to prepare, you know, like get potions and etc. You, you you guys know the drill. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> this is special. This is your first sort of foray into the to the wilds of the world, I should say. And obviously, there's unique encounters. Usually, like there's a, a couple of unique encounters. I'll tuck into every expedition. Uh, 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 every expedition sometimes uh, there's. You might find, uh, you might, like, you might find, like, you know, fucking four encounters on the way there. You might actually go through one encounter. I'll probably make it so that there's at least two. But, uh, now you guys are aware for the future. Alright, so, with that being said, next time we will continue this. We will venture off into the denser and dangerous forests of northern Gilloy, and hopefully we will survive next time. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. But uh, thank you so much for watching. I am ending the stream. Goodbye, everyone.